Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship. My name is Caitlin Nesbitt. I'm the associate pastor here at Faith United Methodist Church. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The second reading is from Mark chapter 4 verses 1 through 9. Again he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a new day and a new year. Shout it out loud. Sing with the crowd. Celebrate cause good things are coming. New opportunities are at the door. Hold your head up. Drop the sorrow. No regrets now for tomorrow. It's a new chance. Good morning again and welcome <coughs> to Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Caleb Hong. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith. Today we're continuing our sermon series on the big questions, um, the very big questions that I think we all wrestle with in life. Last week uh, we began our series with a big question of identity. Who am I? And I share that we are uh, God's beloved children and I reminded us that if you wanted to remember your identity, one of the ways you can do it is to remember your baptism. If you missed the message, uh, check it out. Uh, we have it posted. Uh, it's still up on YouTube and on our Facebook page. Next week, we're going to consider the question of significance. And the question is, what am I living for? 
what makes life significant, worthwhile. You don't want to miss that. Today, we're going to talk uh, about purpose. And the big question for us today is, why am I here? Why am I here? So how would you answer that question? If I asked you to write down your life purpose in a few words, could you do it? If you can, great. I encourage you to write it down, and let's exchange notes afterwards. But if you can't, I'm really glad you're here. You're in the right place. We've got a lot to cover, so let's pray, and we'll begin. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word, your word that offers us direction and hope and life. So, Lord, would your spirit meet us here, right where we are? Would you remind us of your goodness? Would you help us to hear your voice? So open our eyes, open our ears, soften our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So earlier this week, I encountered a dilemma, and the dilemma was fruit flies. Anyone dealing with fruit flies? Uh, so last week, Miss Kim reminded us uh, that January 10th was Houseplant Appreciation Day. I don't know why that one stuck with me, but I'm going home and I'm thinking about it, and I decided I would do something extra special for my three houseplants at home. We only have three. So I began by volunteering to water them for the week. And then um, I, I read on the Internet that it's helpful to aerate the soil. And so I did some of that uh, around these um, plants. The problem was soon after, uh, fruit flies just kind of started to appear around the, the parsonage. So this past Thursday, our older daughter very dramatically points out that there's a large gathering of fruit flies around the house plants. These fruit flies were having a house plant house party at the parsonage. I didn't know what to do. I'd never dealt with this before. I don't have a green thumb. My thumb is like the kiss of death for plants, for the most part. But I wanted to do something. We needed to do something. And so I immediately broke up the fruit fly uh, house party, and I moved the three plants outside. It's cold. It's okay. And then I uh, did what I usually do when I have a question. I went to Google, and I typed in, how do I eliminate fruit flies from house plants? I didn't know if this was a common issue, if anyone else dealt with this. It turns out Google had a lot to say about this. And the simplest solution, according to Google, was to put a little dishwashing soap with water in a spray bottle and just spray uh, these house plants and the soil. And so I did. Miraculously, the house plants survived the cold and the soapy water. And after uh, a couple of days, they were allowed back into the house, now free of fruit flies. You know, when we have questions about house plants and fruit fly house parties, we turn to Google. When we have larger questions about life, where do you turn? I want us to turn to the Bible. So what does the Bible teach us about the reason and the purpose for our existence? As you might imagine, the Bible actually has a ton to say about this. So this morning, it's not going to be short, by the way, just a heads up. <laughs> There's going to be four biblical responses to the big question, why am I here? Here's the first response. I'm here because God created me. I'm here because God created me. I'm alive because God made me. I didn't choose to be born. I didn't choose my birth parents or my family. I didn't choose my birth conditions or my circumstances. I am here because I am God's idea. I am God's beloved child. So if you want to blame or give credit to anyone for my existence or your existence, then blame or give credit to God because God created me. I am God's idea. We are God's creation. So listen to what Paul writes uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we 
heard of Christ and got our hopes up. He had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. So Paul here is telling us that if we want to know who we are and what we're living for, Paul would say, go to the source. Go to the creator, the one who made us purposefully and intentionally. Go to our maker who created us to be part of a larger, glorious plan. So last week... We read in Psalm 139 that God made us again with purpose and on purpose, with purpose and on purpose. The psalmist writes that God made us fearfully and wonderfully in our mother's wombs. God made us and knit us together and God uh, gave each of us our unique set of gifts and graces, passions and personality. Here's another another way to think about this. You are not an accident, and neither am I. Repeat after me. I am not an accident. I am God's beloved child. Yes, there are accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. Yes, there are illegitimate parents, but there are no illegitimate children. Some of us, who are younger, we've been told by older siblings that we were an oopsie baby to our parents. Anyone ever hear that one? (laughs) Yeah. But there are no oopsie babies to God. There are no oopsies with God. God created you. Your life is God's idea. God knew you from the moment of your conception. God had his eye on you long before you were born. You are God's idea, and God loved you enough to entrust you with the breath of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says this, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Friends, without this breath within us, we are lifeless lumps of clay. And on that day, this breath of life leaves us. Our physical bodies will return to ashes and dust. Why are we here? We're here because of God's purpose and God's design. We are not the result of a random cosmic collision. We are not the the accidental uh, consequence of human beings. We're alive because God made us and God entrusted us with the precious breath of life. And God made us stewards of this life with all of its beauties, all of its tragedies, all of its opportunities and challenges for the duration, the course of our lives. Why am I here? Number one, because God created me. God gave me life. Number two, I'm here to love God. I am here to love God. Now, I've read that spiritual emptiness, this, you know, feeling empty that we have sometimes, is a universal dilemma. I've read that many people put their heads on their pillows and say, there's got to be more to life than this. Get up in the morning, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed. Get up in the morning, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed. Get up in the morning, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, go party on the weekends. Is, there all, is this all there is to life? Unfortunately, the answer is no. The Bible tells us that God didn't create us merely to exist, to go through these routines. God created us to live. Jesus tells us in John 10.10 that he came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. So why am I here? First, because God created me. I'm God's idea. Second, because I'm here to love God. We We are created for love. So listen to these words from wisdom literature. This is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And I think if you read this, If you are feeling lost and confused, if you are feeling unfulfilled and dissatisfied in life, if you feel like you're merely existing and life is is not really living, then the Bible would say it's because you are on the wrong path. You're on the wrong path because you trusted in your wisdom over God's wisdom. You're on the wrong path because you leaned on your way over God's way. Instead of leaning on God's understanding, you leaned on your own understanding. Consequently, you live on the path that you chose. When we trust in the Lord with all our hearts, by the way, trusting in God with all of our hearts, code word for love God, right? When you trust in the Lord with all your heart, then God's going to determine your path. This path may be narrow at times and lonely and challenging at other times, but it will always lead to life. On the other hand, when we choose our own path apart from God, outside of God's will, then that way may be wide and straight and have lots of folks traveling on it, but it's a path that will lead to to death. You know, a number of years ago, I had a friend visit from L.A., so I picked him up from Chicago O'Hare Airport, and we were supposed to meet up with another friend at a church in Wheeling, which is not too far from O'Hare. No problem, I thought. I've been to this church in Wheeling once before. It's not too far. I can get us there. Now, this was 12 years years ago uh, before uh, I had a car with GPS, before I even had a phone with GPS. I only had this GPS, right? But my friend, he had a pretty cool phone. He had GPS on his phone. So while I'm musing where I should turn next, he finds the directions to the church on his phone. It's funny now when I think about it. But when he started giving me directions on where to go, I got offended. Okay, I got offended because here's my friend visiting from L.A. He's in Chicago for the very first time, and he's trying to give me directions with his fancy schmancy GPS phone. Ooh. (laughs) So naturally, I insisted, I live here. And I insisted on not following his directions and getting us even more hopelessly lost until eventually I gave up and asked for help. When we feel lost and confused, unfulfilled and dissatisfied with life, when our life feels like we have no idea where we are and where we're going, the the Bible invites us to turn to God for direction, to rely on God for purpose, to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Why am I here? Because God created me. To love God, trust God, because God loves me, and God loves you. Third, I'm here to serve others. I'm here to serve others. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to encourage you to open up to the first reading that Gwen offered from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I'll read it again for us. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. Go to that land that I'm going to show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in Genesis chapter 12, God calls us to do three things. Actually, God calls Abraham to do three things. First, God calls Abraham to trust God, to pack up and leave home, land, people, family. God invites Abraham to put his whole life in the hands of a God that Abraham at this point still barely knows. 
Second, God calls Abraham to know God, to not just leave home, but to go on a road trip with God. Because everyone knows the best way to get to know someone is to go on a road trip with them, right? Third, God called Abraham to love God, to enter into this exclusive covenantal relationship with God, kind of like marriage here. God wanted Abraham to experience God's blessing and become the ancestor of God's beloved people. Now, as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, we are the inheritors of this calling to Abraham, which means this. It means that just as God called Abraham to know, trust, and love God thousands of years ago, God calls us to know, trust, and love God today. But there's more to God's invitation than just our relationship with God. You'll notice this, right? Because at the end of the invitation, God points out that our relationship with God is going to impact our relationship with others. And God tells Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Everyone is going to be blessed. It's kind of like Oprah, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. Everyone's going to be blessed. This includes people we like and people we don't. This includes people of all ethnicities, races, nationalities, even political parties. All the families of the earth will be blessed by the beloved children of God. Why? Because God's will for us is not merely that we love God, but that we love our neighbors. Does this sound familiar? So this past week, I came across a video of Oprah Winfrey. Oprah was offering a commencement speech at Spelman College. Spelman is Atlanta's, uh, America's oldest historically black liberal arts college for women. It is in Atlanta. But anyway, while offering up hopes and dreams for the graduates, Oprah, she challenged the graduates to find ways to serve others. And Oprah quoted Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who said this, Not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great because greatness is determined by service. Let me say that again. Not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great because greatness is determined by service. And so Oprah is here reflecting on Dr. King's words, and she shared her career changed when she made a decision not simply to be on TV, not simply to be famous, but her career changed when she decided to use her fame as an instrument of blessing for others. Her fame and being on TV was no longer going to be an end. It was now going to be a means, not for herself, but for, her, uh, but for others. And Oprah shared that when she made this change, everything changed. When she made this decision, everything changed because she was no longer living for herself. She wanted to claim God's purposes for her life to be a blessing for the world. The truth is all of us are called to this life of blessing and service. Regardless of who we are, whether we're young or old, rich or poor, single or married, working or retired, whatever you, uh, you got, whoever you are, God calls all of us to serve using our unique gifts and talents. So whether you're a preacher or a teacher, singer or a dancer, engineer or accountant or consultant, whether you're a cashier, clerk, whatever it is you do, a retiree, a homeschooling little ones right now, maybe that's where you are in life. God calls all of us to live a life of service, a life that blesses others. Why am I here? I'm here, one, because God created me. Two, to love God. Three, to serve others. Here's the last one. Four, I'm here to bear fruit. I'm here to bear fruit. I'm here to blossom into the unique man and woman that God created me to be. So in our gospel reading, Jesus tells the parable of a farmer 
and this farmer is crazy. This farmer is scattering seeds everywhere, you know, everywhere. And you get a car, and you get a car everywhere. And the seed fell on all kinds of surfaces. Hard path, rocky soil, thorny soil, good soil. And depending on the type of service that received it, the seeds either perished or flourished. The seeds that fell on hard path, they were gone, like in an instant. Hungry birds came and gobbled them up. The seeds that fell on rocky soil, they sprouted quickly, but they also died quickly because when the sun came out, it burned their roots, which were really, really shallow. The seeds that, for, uh, that fell on thorny grounds, sure, they found some space to grow, but they never did anything because they were choked out by weeds, competed for their time, their attention for their souls. Only the seeds that fell on good soil thrived. And in good soil, the seeds not only grew, but they multiplied. And they bore fruit 30, 60, 100 times over. All of us have the potential to be all four types of soil. We can be like the hard path one day, thorny soil the next. We have that capacity. We can be good soil on Sunday and rocky soil on Monday. Sometimes I feel like that. Jesus invites us to be good soil every day, soil that fully embraces God's word and promise for our lives because Jesus wants us to bear fruits. He wants us to embrace the unique way that God created us. Jesus wants us to blossom into the women and men God created us to be. But if we want to blossom, if we want to bear fruit, we first have to discover who we are. We have to be honest with who we are. And by the way, this is not an easy process because we are not like anyone else, right? God made us so differently. Did you know that in one cubic foot of snow, there are 18 million snowflakes? Who in the world would figure that out? But I read it. I believe it. I read it on the Internet. <laughs> one cube, anyway. The incredible reality, of course, is that there are no two snowflakes that are exactly alike. Every snowflake is different from the rest. Every snowflake that's ever made is different from every other snowflake that's ever been made. Likewise, 2021, there is an estimated 7.8 billion people on planet Earth. 7.8 billion people on planet Earth now. The incredible reality is that there are no people who are exactly the same. Every person is distinct. Even identical twins are different in many ways. The point is, God made you uniquely you. You're one of a kind. You are original. There's no one exactly like you. No one who is going to share your exact voice print, thumbprint, footprint, DNA. Therefore, God is inviting you to bear fruit by being the very best you that God made you to be. Discover who you are. Embrace your God-given potential, your talents, your gifts. Don't get sidetracked trying to be like everyone else. Don't get caught up trying to please everyone else. Take time to get to know who you are. You can find personality tests like Myers-Briggs. You can find spiritual gifts inventories online. Just Google Myers-Briggs spiritual gifts inventories. You can ask friends and family who know you well <coughs> to offer you their reflections about you, their honest reflections. But I think the most important key is simply to be honest with yourself. Be true to who you are, who God created you to be. And in doing so, you're going to bear fruit. So let's recap. Why am I here? One, because... God created me, number two, to love God, three, to serve others, four, to bear fruit. Let's start wrapping up. So um, when Moses 
uh, was encountering God, and God met Moses through the burning bush. You know the story in the book of Moses. God calls Moses to lead the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. And to Moses, who's familiar with what's happening in Egypt, this sounds like mission impossible. And so when he heard this, Moses, he is doubtful and he's afraid. And in his doubt and fear, he questions who God is. And God responds, I am who I am. That tactic didn't work. So then Moses questioned his own qualifications. How is he going to do this? He has so many flaws and failures. How could he possibly do what God was calling him to do? And he begs God to call someone else. And God responds, this is Exodus chapter 4, by asking Moses, what he had in his hand. What do you have in your hand, Moses? What an important question. Moses responds, a staff. I have a staff in my hand. And God commands Moses to throw this staff down, see what God could do with a simple staff. And so Moses did. And if you remember the story or you watched the Ten Commandments, you know that the staff, it becomes a snake, and then when Moses picks it up again, that snake becomes a staff. What's the point of this miracle? Is God just showing off? What was God trying to teach Moses? God wanted Moses to identify his gifts, what was in his hand. God wanted to recognize what he had and who he was, and God wanted to assure Moses that this was enough, that God could use even this. When we are partnering with God, the creator, the maker of the entire universe, what we have in our hands, even if it seems like very little, is enough for God. Think about this. A shepherd's staff, it represented several things about Moses. It represented his identity. It's his livelihood, his day job. It represented his income because wealth and assets, it's tied up in livestock. It represented influence because the staff allowed Moses to direct, to guide his sheep. So when God is calling Moses to lay down his staff, what God is inviting Moses to do is to trust God with all of who he is, warts and all. God wants Moses to entrust God with every part of his life, his identity, his income, his influence. It didn't matter that Moses was imperfect. It didn't matter that Moses was flawed or even that he's scared. The invitation simply is to trust and to follow and if we do so, if he did so, God promised to use Moses to free the Hebrews from Egypt to bless all the families of the earth. So let me ask you, what's in your hand? What do you have in your hands? What do you have that's been entrusted to you? Your time, your talents, your education, your influence, your wealth, your resources, your health, your freedom. What do you have in your hands, and what are you doing with it now? And more significant for this message, what are you going to do with it tomorrow? Will you love God, serve others, bear fruit? Will you do the good that God created you to do with the unique gifts and graces that God entrusted specifically to you? Will you trust God with what's in your hand, with all of your hearts, with the fullness of your life? And I pray that you will. That however God is calling you today, that you'll respond faithfully and well, with honor, with love, and with excellence. So with that thought, I want to close again with a, a quote from Dr. King, who if he was asked the question, why am I here, he might answer it in this way. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well.
Let's pray. Lord, we confess that so often we're lost. We don't know who we are or where we are. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Lord, a lot of us, we just feel beat up in life. We're tired. We pursued our own path. We've taken our own, you know, we just strived after our own way. It's hard. But we thank you that in the midst of our lives, even when we run away from you and your way, you invite us back. You invite us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, to lean not on our own understanding, in all of our ways to acknowledge you because you will make our path straight. Lord, would you hear the prayers of our hearts this day? That for those of us who are wondering who I am, you would remind us we are God's beloved son and daughter and child. For those of us who are wondering why am I here, would you remind us that you made us with clarity, with purpose, and with intention. Help us to love you. Help us to love others. Help us to bear the fruit that you created us to bear. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this worship service. I want to just, again, uh, encourage you one more week in this very important three-week series. If you know of people in your family or friends who are asking these questions, point them to our website, uh, to our Facebook page, to our YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, now at this time, if you would, uh, turn to a neighbor around you uh, and you can make a sign of love and uh, say, God loves you and so do I. And if you are watching this all by yourself, just look into the camera and say, God loves you and so do I. Um, it's easy to wonder who we are and what in the world we're here to do. The good news is the, the Bible tells us who we are, what we're here for. So let's go with confidence and joy that we are God's beloved children called to serve God, uh, uh, love God, serve others, and bear fruit. Let's do this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.